hand, I'm going to try and check again. Uh, has the video appeared for the remote participants? We will be using it to share slides. Our two first speakers do have slides, so just to check. I understand we are still not visible on the scene. Just letting you know we can we can see you now. You're on the big screen. Oh, good. There you go. There we go. Brilliant. Look at us. Big Thank heads you so on the wall. Much. All right. Okay, we have been saved. Wonderful. If everyone's ready and I do not hear an objection, I would be glad to start us off. Welcome to <clears throat> session 307. And uh, this time we uh, encourage you to join us to discuss uh, data governance in broadband satellite services. That's the theme we have chosen for this panel. Um, the group of presenters we have managed to, um, to complete for this uh, panel has been working on uh, satellite connectivity and internet access for a while. We will go through the introductions in due course. And for this specific session, we have decided to focus on data, these new technologies that support internet connectivity all rely on what has been referenced as the new oil. So we are very much looking forward to discussing that specific aspect of internet connectivity and satellite infrastructures. My name is Jan Nakulasha. I work as an assistant professor of international law at the University of Lodz in Poland. And for the past year and a half, together with my co-lead on an ISAC Foundation project, we have been working to better understand the legal framework um, behind uh, low Earth orbit satellites and internet connectivity. Uh, and Bernard Talikor is one of the panelists on this project as well. Uh, we have managed to connect a to uh, put together a panel of excellent speakers. Uh, whom I'm going to kindly ask to introduce themselves in due course for the purpose of time. Um, our scoping questions for this session do include both the technological aspect of low Earth orbit satellites and in internet connectivity. And uh, that is uh, a kind request to our first two speakers to shed some light on that specific theme. We will then move forward to better understand what are the regulatory constraints behind using technologies like SpaceX, but uh, I'm certain our speakers will emphasize that that is by far not the only company that is offering satellite infrastructures for internet connectivity. And then we will look at regulatory impacts that the governments are trying to uh, cause within different jurisdictions as well as the civil society feedback to the possibility of deploying these new infrastructures and um, regulating, managing, processing the data that flows through them. Uh, I have kindly asked our panelists to present for seven to 10 minutes. As already said, we have quite a rich agenda. So without further ado, I am going to ask them to take the floor and then we will move directly into the Q&A. So if our audience members do have questions or comments, they are more than uh, welcome to either post them in the chat, I will be monitoring the chat, or simply wait until the Q&A session. It will be moderated in the room by Bernard Salibor, and we will give you ample time to share your feedback. With this, I hand the floor over to Dan York, who has been leading a dedicated project within the Internet Society on low Earth orbit satellites, completed with an, an insightful report. Uh, I am certain that we will uh, be uh, provided with a link to that report in due course. Dan has been working for ISOC as the, um, the director for Internet Technology, so we could ask for no better speaker than to than Dan to give us an introduction into satellite infrastructures and internet connectivity. Dan, thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Joanna, and thank you for everybody who's coming and attending this session, whether you're in, in the room there in Kyoto or online, wherever you may be. And this is a, a fascinating topic around data governance, and I could go off on any topics, but I've been asked to kind of focus on the technology side and kind of set the stage to make sure we're all using the same terms, working in the same kind of space and working with that. 
So to begin with, I work for the Internet Society. I've been there for 12 years. I'm currently the director of Internet Technology. I have a focus around um, one of the aspects is connecting the unconnected and how do we do that using low Earth orbit satellites, among other technologies. Um, the let's let me go and talk a little bit. It's all focused around the Internet for everyone. And how do we bring those people together to begin any conversation on satellites? We need to talk about orbits. And this is the critical part to understand what's going on right now and why there's so much energy and excitement. We've had <clears throat> satellites that are that have been providing internet access for for decades now. Almost all of those have been out at what are called geostationary or geosynchronous orbit out at around 36,000 kilometers away from the Earth. These are large satellites, typically the size of a large bus or something bigger. They cost millions of dollars, many millions of dollars. Sometimes they take a long time to get out there, and and but they provide service for sometimes 15, 20 years or more. They, they can provide decent bandwidth. The challenge that they have is they are so far out that the, the amount of time it takes for a, a packet to go from the Earth out to the satellite and get back can be 600 milliseconds, 800, 900, a second, or even more. And that, that the challenge that has is that in today's world, when we want to have video conversations like this one, you need something with a much smaller amount of what we call latency or lag. And this is where we start to look at the other areas. There is a, um, a medium Earth orbit, which is between 2,000 and 36,000. And that's kind of, there's a range of things that are in there. There is a provider, um, SES, which has the O3B satellites that do exist out in that kind of range. They, um, they are a little bit closer, have a little bit better latency, but the energy, the excitement is all down in this space below 2,000 kilometers, which is the low Earth orbit, or LEO, as we say here, or LEO, however you want to call it. This is where the space stations are. This is where so many of our satellites are, imaging, sensing, everything else. All of this is happening in this space. Now, part of what goes on and why we're getting into this is that at the farther away you are, the more, the bigger the range of the Earth that you can cover. So you can go and with out at the geosynchronous area, you can have three satellites and you can be able to cover basically the entire Earth by positioning them in different areas. If you're in the middle Earth orbit, some of the systems there can do maybe 20 or so. They're orbiting, they go faster, et cetera. When you get down into the LEO area, you need a lot of satellites because they're moving out constantly in motion around there. Um, OneWeb, which is now Eutelsat OneWeb, is uh, around 1,200 kilometers away from the Earth, and they have about 600 satellites. SpaceX, with their Starlink, and Amazon Project Kuiper and others who are in this play are a little bit lower. They're about 500, 500, 600 kilometers away from the Earth, and they need about 3,000 satellites to go and cover it. So it's a, it's a different scale that you see here going on. These are this world of LEOs, or low-Earth orbit satellites, that we see around here. What's happened that's driving this interest in, in LEOs is that this need for this high-speed, low-latency connectivity. We want to have connections like this. We want to be in gaming. We want virtual worlds. We want esports. We want you know fast connectivity to be able to communicate and connect with people. And the challenge is that just hasn't worked in the past with GEO. But the thing that's driving it is this massive reduction in costs. These LEO satellites might be the size of a car or even smaller in some cases. They can be mass produced and rolling off production lines. They can be sent up in rockets with 50 of them at a time. And those rockets can be reusable now, as we've seen with SpaceX. So there's this massive change in the way that we're able to go and deploy rockets and things that are out there. Three parts to any of these systems. One is this constellation of satellites. Okay, that's the thing we all think about when it goes up there. Each of them are launched at different altitudes. There's different, what they call orbital shells that are around the, there, different ways. There's also the user terminal is the language used in satellite speak, the ground terminal or something. Normal, I mean, people just out there often just call it an antenna or a dish or, or you know, that kind of thing. But that's the piece of, that's the hardware that you use. The big difference that's happened is that you need a fancier antenna. With a geostationary satellite, you can just put an antenna on the side of your house or top of the house, you point it at the satellite, and, it, and it's done because that satellite is fixed over a certain part of the Earth as it rotates. 
And so you can just put the dish up there. And that's what you see in all over the world. Well, that doesn't work when your satellites are moving at a high pace and they might only be over the earth in view for five or 10 minutes. So you need these new antennas that are electronically steerable, phased array, lots of different words for them, it gets in there. But basically they're the things that you see, if you've seen anything with Starlink there, they look like a pizza box or something. Amazon Kuiper has similar ones. OneWeb has some similar kinds of ideas. The companies that are selling direct to consumer often accompany that with a Wi-Fi router or something else. And then there's also ground stations. And these are the, the, the receiving end of where that signal goes up to a satellite, comes down to a ground station, connects out to the internet. Now, these are different for each of the providers. One web's ground station is different than SpaceX's, which will be different than Amazon Kuiper's, which is different from ones used by Intelsat or one of the other geo providers. They're all their own separate space in there, but they need that ground station to connect to. Now, this is something, and Larry's going to talk a little bit more about this in a bit, but this is something that's changed a bit. Historically, you needed to have a ground station in each country for legal reasons and things, but also within a certain range. The satellite had to be able to look down and see the ground station. So you had to have them maybe every 900 kilometers, something. You had to have them spaced out around the Earth. And this is why. Because you would have this user terminal, sat at the dish, connect up to a satellite, bounce down to a ground station, and go out to the internet. Of course, in the LEO space, it might look a little bit more like this. Some of your packets would go to one satellite, the other ones would come back there. One of the big changes or revolutions in this space is what if you're not in range to a local ground station? This is what Larry's going to talk a little about is this idea around what are called intersatellite lasers, which allow you to go and connect up to the satellite, bounce across the mesh, and then drop down to a ground station and then connect out there. Now, SpaceX has demonstrated this already when you look at things such as they did some experiments in um, Antarctica with Starlink dishes there that connected up to the Starlink mesh, the constellation, went across the constellation and dropped down to a ground station somewhere else. There are no ground stations for this in Antarctica. It was connecting up and across. It was also demonstrated in the Iran protests when the US government and others asked Starlink to turn on Starlink access in the country of Iran, and they did. There aren't any legal ground stations in Iran. They were taking that, that data up into the satellite constellation and then dropping it down somewhere into some other ground stations there. There's a range of different kinds of data flow tech issues we could talk about here, about where does the where does the data get dropped down to? Who's in control of that? A lot of different topics around that that I'm not going to get into, but we'll talk more about that. Just quickly, some of the concerns or things that we have to think about are affordability. Can these systems really be affordable for the people who need them the most? There's a bunch of different business models that are being brought in here. Will they have the capacity to support all that we need? Certainly, we've seen in some areas, they provide tremendous capacity for everything you need. When you get in the more densely populated areas, actually, you wind up with having challenges in some of this. Will there be competition? What are the business models? Right now, one of the biggest challenges is simply deployment. There's a limited number of providers, really only SpaceX right now, who is able to go and launch satellites up into space at the pace that you need to launch because you've got to get thousands of satellites up in the low Earth orbit. And because they only have a five-year lifespan, you need to keep replacing. We're in a weird spot where a lot of the other launch providers, Ariane Space, United Launch Alliance, Jeff Bezos' new Blue Origin, they're in between launch vehicles like they're, the Ariane 5, there's no more rockets, and the Ariane 6 hasn't been deployed yet. There's other pieces like that. So we're in a weird spot. So one of the big challenges is just getting the rocket, getting the satellites up there in the first place. There are other concerns, security, privacy, standards, what standards are being used. Now, if you use a Starlink connection, it works with all the typical internet standards. Those are all open. It works across there. How they're routing inside their infrastructure is right now primarily primarily. Um, proprietary. There's issues around space debris, lots of things that come into these kind of spaces. We don't fully understand the sustainable business models. There's questions around the environmental impact of all of this. What will it be? The impact on astronomy. There's a lot of open questions. And that's really one of the reasons why we need to have sessions like this 
at the IGF and other places is because this is an industry that is still in its infancy. We need to understand a bit of this. I will put a point on the urgency around this. The next several years are going to be very critical because there's a lot of people launching these systems. Starlink has already launched its it, much of its generation one, its first phase, which will ultimately be about 4,400 satellites. They're in the process of launching the first part of their second generation, which will be 7,500 satellites, growing to around 30,000 satellites. OneWeb has completed their first phase of around 600, but they're going to be launching more. They, they're on the books to do that. Amazon just last week launched its first two demonstration satellites, but it's on the track to go and launch another 3,200 over the next couple of years. China is proposing a, a, their own constellation, which will rival Starlinks at about 13,000 satellites. The European Union is looking to develop its own IRIS constellation. If you look at the numbers that are filed with the ITU in terms of satellites, it's conceivable that over the next four to five years, we could have 40, 50, 60, maybe even 90,000 satellites orbiting the Earth. And this is just the internet access ones, not even thinking about imaging or sensor networks or other stuff. So it's a very crowded space up there. Data flows are going to be a big part of thinking about through how all this works. And with that, I will just say, Joanna's right. We did have a report that we issued last year. We're still working on that. You can get it at internetsite.org slash Leo's where we talk and frame a lot of these kind of issues. And with that, I'm going to turn it to Larry to dive into lasers a little bit more. All right. Let's see. Okay. Can you guys see me and hear me? We can hear you and see you. And see me. Okay. Let me, um, let's see. I've got to figure out how to share my screen and get some slides going too. Oops. All right, can you guys see my slides? We do. Okay, all right. <clears throat> yeah, what I'm gonna talk about, as Dan said, he gave a great overview. I'm gonna be very focused in kind of a narrow niche, which is uh, optical laser communi or laser communication between space and the ground. Uh, not even uh, just have one slide on the internet, uh, inter-satellite links. And the reason I'm doing it is because I think it may have a significant impact on this uh, sustainable development goal, number nine in particular. Uh, so you can see the picture on the right. Uh, it depicts satel a few satellites in the sky in the, in the space. Uh, and the kind of narrow lines between them are inner satellite links that Dan talked about. And then those thicker lines depict laser links communicating with ground stations or gateways uh, on the ground. And uh, I'm gonna focus my, my talk on the ground, on the links to the ground stations. But I'm gonna have one slide. Uh, let's see, come on buddy, here you go. One slide, one slide on the inner, inner satellite links. Uh, Dan said SpaceX was the first. They now have about um, 8,000 optical terminals in orbit. Um, and they've recently begun uh, launching their second generation, which uh, go faster. They go 100 gigabits per, up to 100 gigabits per second. Uh, as you can see, each satellite has three terminals. Uh, two of them point uh, forward and backward in the same orbital plane, orbital plane as the satellite is going. Uh, uh, thir uh, thir the third one can go uh, left or right, and I'm not sure, no, I, who knows, but I think it can perhaps go down, point to the ground, and that's what we're going to talk about now, satellite co uh, communication between the satellite and the ground. Um, <clears throat> why are we concerned with or excited about optical? Uh, what optical communication. Right now, it's radio frequency communication to those ground stations. And optical has many, many advantages. I've listed them there on the left. Uh, I'm not going to read them to you, 
and maybe the most interesting is license free. There is no problem with getting uh, with interference with spectrum that there is with the radio frequency. Um, it's like a laser pointer, um, and RF is more like a flashlight that uh, kind of spreads out the, the signal that gets diffused. And there are even some little side signals that completely don't go to the right place. Uh, what's not to like, uh, it's the atmosphere. Things like clouds and rain and stuff uh, get in the way of optical uh, signals. They can distort them and cut back their, um, their power. So the payoff would be really great, as was just illustrated. Uh, and for that reason, many really smart and uh, people and business people are working on them. I'm going to run through really quickly uh, five groups. I'm not going to say much about any of them, uh, but I will have links, a lot of links that you can follow up on all of these. Okay, NASA has been doing it since 2013. They've got many projects, uh, many experiments with space to ground communication, optical. <clears throat> Uh, I'll just say this one is 200 gigabits per second from a little CubeSat, CubeSat from space to the ground. That is way fast. That's a thousand times faster than we're used to. Uh, and that's the kind of payoff that will come from this stuff if it works. All right. Uh, universities are doing a lot of experiments and research. This one's interesting. It's from the uh, Federal Technical University in Switzerland. Uh, they have got a deal where they've got a, uh, a satellite a, a terminal up here on top of a mountain, and they've got a terminal down here at their uh, institute. The whole distance depicted there is about 53 kilometers. And you can see that it's going through some of this stuff like uh, turbulent air, and it's over a lake with water vapor, the kind of stuff that screws up uh, laser transmission in the atmosphere. And with adaptive optics that they have a, a little tiny a chip with 97 tiny adjustable mirrors that can uh, make adjustments 15,000 times a second. Things like that are inconceivable, but they, they exist. Uh, and they're also working on modulation schemes, way to encode the ones and zeros into the signal. Uh, and so they've been able to achieve like 94 terabits per second uh, almost uh, 90, 0.94, almost a terabit per second transmission rates. They say they're working on new modulation schemes, new software uh, to encode things and make it go faster. And it can be scaled up to 40 channels. So that uh, would be an incredible amount of, of data coming from space. And the second uh, university one has to do not with the data uh, transmission rate, but with being able to track the satellites, like Dan says, as they move across the uh, sky. And so what these guys have done is uh, put up a drone, and it goes back and forth at 65 kilometers per hour, but that simulates the sort of one degree per second uh, that a, a satellite in low Earth orbit would uh, transcend. And in fact, they have no trouble uh, tracking it and transferring data from it. Uh, the military, no surprise, is really interested in this stuff. Uh, one most really interesting thing is the uh, Space Development Agency. It's part of the Space Force. They have what they call the, uh, the uh, transport layer constellation. It's going to have um, between 300 and, and more than 500. They haven't really decided yet satellites. And these will have uh, laser links between the satellites and also space to ground. Uh, laser links. And a key thing is this, they have a real philosophy of working with commercial suppliers. So um, that's really an interesting one to watch. Um, yeah. Speaking of commercial suppliers, uh, I think the most interesting one is a company called Illyria. It's a startup. They acquired their intellectual property for two products from Google. Uh, they, it's really a bunch of guys that used to work at Google. Uh, the products are called Space, space Time and Tight Beam. Um, and Tight Beam is an optical communication technology. And uh, Space Time is sort of a network management system. Let me tell you about Tight Beam because that's what we're talking about. Like the guys in Switzerland, 
they are working on a hybrid approach and it sounds real similar. They have adjustable mirrors and clever software. Um, <clears throat> and they say they are uh, getting now, they also uh, do tests uh, from a mountain uh, near their headquarters. Um, and they're getting tests that are uh, going at 400 megabits per second. And uh, so if you have four of those, that's one point. Oh yeah, you can uh, put channels together, which give you 1.6 terabits per second. Um, and the reason I wanna kind of bring them up in this context is on the right-hand side, you see a couple of slides uh, from a demonstration that they've done, uh, put together of this. I'll tell you a little bit more about it in, in the next slide. But one of the things the demonstration or the, the software takes uh, cognizance of is the surface temperatures on the Earth and atmospheric conditions. And that enables SpaceTime, which is their uh, other product, which does the routing and whatnot, to route around the kind of bad uh, atmospheric conditions that I spoke of before. Let's look at SpaceTime. Uh, these are again from the same demo. Uh, you can see the scope of this thing. Uh, the, the, this is a demo of a hypothetical network that reaches from the moon to Earth. And if you zoom in, you can see it's also working on uh, ships at sea and airplanes in the air and, of course, satellites in, in orbit. Uh, so it's a very comprehensive kind of a network operating system for controlling uh, both fixed and, mess fixed and mobile assets and the links between them uh, on the Earth and wherever they are, a space. Uh, outer space, deep space. They are definitely have deep space in their their planning. A um, the guy sent me a. I had a little exchange on Twitter yesterday about. Uh, yeah, they're heading for Mars, not just the Moon. Um, this project is super comprehensive, but it's also it's reminiscent to me of the ARPANET back in the old days. And I list some of the reasons here. It's uh, the software is open source. They're trying to do standards. Networks can federate and access each other's uh, assets. It really sounds uh, both ambitious uh, and like the inner uh, ARPANET, but a thousand times more ambitious. But uh, I would strongly advise you to watch the demo. Uh, and you know, the, these slides came out of. Okay, another uh, commercial thing. Uh, oh, it's a university. It should say commercial. I'm sorry. Another uh, commercial. Uh, uh, company that's worth paying a little attention to is Intelsat. They're one of the traditional geostationary satellite operators that Dan talked about, but they are doing uh, interesting, pro uh, what do you call it, partnership products. They are working with SpaceX to taste, text, eh, test space to ground optical communication and uh, with one web on airline con connectivity, and they are going to use the Alaria. Uh, uh, operating system. So keep an eye on them. Okay, I mentioned that China would, you have to talk about China these days. Um, and mentioned Guolong, uh, that's really something, but they're, they're gonna have a hard time launching all those satellites uh, before Elon Musk is sitting on, the, on Mars. Um, but at any rate, China is behind, seems to be behind in this uh, optical uh, communication between space and the earth. Uh, I could only find these two projects just kind of looking around for this talk. I talked to a friend of mine who's uh, a colleague who's in China and knows everything about the Chinese internet and space business. And he couldn't add to this. So they don't seem to have much going at, at the present. Okay. And there's bad news, though. That was a lot of good news. And a lot of people, smart people, put a lot of energy into this. The bad news is there are no optical ground stations anywhere. Uh, and so that's gonna take a bunch of investment. One approach is, or some of it can be done by augmenting the, the uh, existing, RF, some of the RF gateways that, that are already existing. Uh, they, if they're in good geographic locations, that might make sense because they already have the real estate around the ground station. They have power coming in. Most important, they all have high-speed internet connectivity uh, at their locations. If you look at this map, these are the, the green pinpoints of the SpaceX gateways. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in, in North America, there's 75 of them. And you can see, though, that some of these gateways are in Southwest you know, United States. 
Some are in northern Mexico, some are in Arizona, uh, in uh, Arizona, in Australia, uh, places that might make suitable locations for a uh, optical gateway. Uh, the other thing, though, that won't be enough. They'll have, you'll have to construct new gateways. Uh, one would try to put them in arid regions, at locations near centers of demand, at locations that have already high-speed internet, uh, terrestrial connectivity. Uh, 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 observatories come to mind as, as likely places to have them. They have a lot of those characteristics. But it's going to take a lot of money, careful analysis um, to build that infrastructure out if this um, stuff takes off. To come back to the uh, development goal, number, sustainable de development goal number nine, uh, I just want to talk for a second or two about Africa. Uh, right now if in Africa, uh, there are only two gateways uh, to the SpaceX. SpaceX has only two publicly known gateways. Uh, and so they could use uh, some connectivity. Um, they have an advantage uh, in that they, they're the, the brown, the sort of arid spots on this map uh, tend to be in the north and the south, uh, though there are others. And that is an advantage because um, yeah, the satellites uh, have inclined orbits. They, they don't just go around the equator, but they kind of go north and south. Some of them are almost uh, go over the poles. Um, and what that means is these inter-satellite links are going to be more efficient for them uh, for north-south uh, links than they are for going east and west. Uh, so it's this is kind of looking, that's looking good for our Africa. You can imagine some gateways in the north and some gateways in the south. Um, the other thing is seasonal variation. Obviously, it's, uh, I mean, this is a nut, it's not, in the northern hemisphere, it's you know different than in the southern hemisphere, and um, by having this kind of north to south, having these two areas that are uh, in the same uh, longitude uh, gives them gives them another advantage. Uh, they will have good weather at least somewhere, or maybe in both places at all times. Uh, now I'm giving you a, kind of a really fast positive view of the whole thing. Here's a reality check. Uh, this quote, personally, I don't think optical to low Earth orbit is really going to go. And the guy that said it is the president and CEO of KSAT, which is a Norwegian company. It's a, uh, um, an established uh, optical ground station company. And they tried an optical ground station in Greece in 2020, and it failed commercially. So um, this is not a slam dunk. There are tons of uh, investments needed, and there's tons of research and, and development that needs to be done. Um, okay, that's about what I was going to say. I've got, uh, you can see here my email address and a place where I talk about this stuff a lot. Uh, and if you'd like to see a copy of those slides, which have tons of links, uh, just send me a link or send me a request. Oh. Yeah, here's a, a frequency terminology cheat sheet, cheat, cheat sheet for those who would like it. And that is the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larry. That was a lot of information. And we particularly appreciate the developing countries focus. That is one of the themes we have been exploring um, throughout yeah. both of the projects, the one that Dan mentioned and the one that our next speaker and myself have been um, working on. So it's most appreciated uh, um, uh, that you have provided us with this very broad uh, technological overview and my sincerest thanks to Dan for his uh, lasting support and uh, yet another great intervention. With that, without further ado, I'm glad to hand the floor over to Professor Berna Aksaligura from uh, Queen Mary University in London, who's a convener in outer space law. Uh, which brings us to the regulatory component of this panel, again with a kind request to our speakers to try and limit their intervention to seven to ten minutes. I hand the floor over to Berna with a kind request for a um, brief review of whether all of these wonderful novel technologies are actually regulated, and if so, if there is a data regulation component that we might wish to focus on. Berna, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Joanna. I have PowerPoint. Um, okay, there we go. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here today to discuss data governance in broadband satellite services. Um, I am joined by an esteemed panel of experts who bring a wealth of knowledge and experience on this topic. And um, as you said, my task is to delve into the um, regulatory aspects of satellite connectivity and hopefully provide you all with uh, some insight. Okay, so uh, I don't think this is working. Oh, there we go. So um, the mega satellite constellations attracted wide scale global attention on 26th of February 2022 two days after the Russian invasion of Ukraine started. Well, Elon Musk, SpaceX founder and CEO, responded to a request um, from the Ukrainian deputy prime minister confirming on Twitter that Starlink satellite internet service has become active in Ukraine. This news came after the cyber attack by Russia on another satellite system on, owned by Viasat. The primary target of the cyber attack is believed to have been the communication lines of the Ukrainian military, as it was just one hour before Russia launched this major, major invasion of Ukraine. But the impact was more extensive. It affected thousands of internet users and internet connected devices, including the wind farms in Central Europe. It is unclear whether the um, spillover was unintentional. Well, the solution for the disruption was another satellite system, Starlink, a new mega constellation then. Well, until this time, the provision of broadband internet had been considered an experimental alternative to undersea and on-the-ground telecommunication services. But suddenly, it became the communication lifeline for a war-torn country. As expected, this received a lot of press coverage. The celebrity status of the company owner also contributed to this. Around this time, we saw it being used in disaster zones, such as the flooding in northern New South Wales and remote villages in Tonga after volcanic eruption and tsunami. Well, soon after they launched services in Ukraine, an uprising in Iran started. The government applied restrictions on internet access, so the protesters called Mr. Musk to help restore their internet connectivity. This time, he wasn't able to help at first than he was, but achieved limited reach. And it wasn't because Starlink services did not have coverage over Iran, technically, but primarily for legal reasons. There were US restrictions for providing services to Iran, and Iranian government had not authorized Star Starlink to provide services within their borders. So in both of these examples, um, the company acted in a manner that reflected the pre preferences of its home state. So in the first year that this company started providing services, it didn't really shy away from making political choices. And as we all know, the concerns regarding cross-border data transfers and data governance have a geopolitical dimension as well. In that sense, relying on this infrastructure for transferring, storing, or processing data is very much perceived as relying on a US infrastructure for, for connectivity and data transfers. As one would expect in the current state of affairs, Russia and China have already declared that they will not allow the provision of satellite broadband by a US service provider and cited, cited cybersecurity as the main concern. Okay, so um, it's not. Okay, sorry. I okay. Confirming the prevalence of data governance concerns in a survey Joanna and I um, conducted for Isaac uh, for our Isaac Foundation funded research on the global governance of satellite broadband, the respondents chose data privacy as one of their primary concerns, and in another question. They chose an international treaty on data flows and standards development approach as the best way to tackle concerns regarding global data value chain being monopolized by a small number of Leo broadband companies. This survey was more than a year ago, 
We are still in the early stages of this technology, so we'll see what the future brings and how the data governance regulations take shape. Now, so far, I have established two things. There's a geopolitical dimension to the use of satellite broadband, and data govern governance has started to be associated with its use. So what sort of measures can countries employ to address their concerns? I'll go back to this, yes. Well, some EU countries and the UK have already licensed Starlink to provide services, although they have or plan to have their own satellite systems. The plan is to create a competitive market, but all licensed service providers are expected to comply with the domestic data governance regimes. On the PowerPoint, you see Starlink's commitment on its website to comply with the GDPR for its customers in the EU. Major spacefaring nations have also embarked on projects that will give them their own satellite constellations. A good example is China and the EU. The justification of these ventures goes beyond data governance, but it is a significant factor. So what is the exact contours of um, domestic jurisdiction over satellite services? Let me go back. Yes. So while well, the, prov uh, the provision of satellite services in a particular country is subject to that country's laws and regulations, and the framework covers much more than data governance, the satellite companies need to comply with all to be able to provide services in a particular jurisdiction. The ground station. For that, the companies will need authorization from each relevant jurisdiction. Even if they do not need to establish one technically, they may be required to. They will also need to obtain a license to use the frequency spectrum. The frequency spectrum is coordinated at the international level by the ITU. However, at the domestic level, it is a national regulatory agency that assigns them. Of course, in compliance with what is agreed at the ITU. If the com companies provide their services directly to consumers, they will also likely need an internet service provider license, which will include a license for the use of terminals by consumers. The importation of their user terminals will also be subject to the import requirements of the national authorities. The states will want to check the conformity of, uh, of their new measures with their commitments in their trade treaties. Well, satellite connectivity is not new, and the fact that it is being provided by <coughs> via mega constellations does not mean existing regulations do not apply. Regulators are updating the provisions to address the unique challenges of mega constellations, but essentially, the existing regulatory framework is applicable. I hope this brief explanation um, gives you an overall idea. Um, I want to go back to, um, hold on. Okay. I <laughs> I couldn't find that website. Um, if you would like to read more on the topic, please check our website. I'll provide the link in the chat um, where you can find a detailed report on the subject and the shorter and shorter policy papers for governments and civil society organizations. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. There seems to be a lot of regulation on both uh, telecommunications and data. Yet when we look at these new advancements in infrastructure, the question is whether these are sufficient, whether they are relevant, whether we are back to national laws and national regulations, and uh, whether the multi-stakeholder model still matters with regard to internet connectivity. And with that question in terms of how developmental help uh, should be provided to countries who are still deciding on how to expand internet connectivity in their jurisdictions. I turn the floor to our next speaker, Dr. Uta Meyer Han, who's the advisor for digital technologies at the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit. And I'm very much looking forward to Uta discussing the developmental context of uh, new technologies supporting internet connectivities and Leos in particular. I know you have been working on these uh, topics, so I'm very curious to hear um, your perspective. Uta, thank you for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Uta Meyer Hahn, and I am with GIZ, which is a public benefit federal enterprise. So we support the German government and a host of public and private sector clients 
in achieving their objectives in international cooperation. GIZ, uh, some may know this or not, but we work in around 120 countries around the globe on a wide ver variety of areas, and that also includes fostering digital policy for sustainable development. So why do we as an organization in the field of international cooperation work on LEO satellite or satellite internet in general? Isn't that this expensive niche technology with limited capacity that will never ever be the internet for you and me? These arguments I keep hearing and they may sound and be valid, so I, need to, I feel like we need to do some clarification about what we can and what we cannot expect from LEO satellite internet. And here I would like to make four points. The first point is about time, which we don't have. Because internet connectivity is widely recognized as a catalyst for development. This means that regions with, with access to better internet connectivity are progressing at a relatively rapid pace compared to those without. And this means again, in other words, that the digital divide or divides grow larger with time. Therefore, it's important to not only increase meaningful connectivity overall, but to do so quickly. This is where LEO satellite or broadband from space may come in. It requires minimal terrestrial infrastructure, as we sh we've just heard, uh, which is heavily under development. And because of that very feature, it could bridge digital divides faster than other connectivity solutions. So this, to my mind, is not a discussion about either or. We, it's not about either fiber and mobile infrastructure development. We must continue this, obviously. But we can complement those efforts with broadband from space to make speedy advancements in connecting the unconnected. So I find that there's the sense of urgency in the discussion about connectivity that sometimes gets lost um, in this discussion. My second point is about robustness. LEO satellite internet broadband from space can provide communications when traditional local networks may have gone down, as was just mentioned by Berna, due to conflict, due to natural disasters, due to man-made disasters. And having this type of connectivity from space in place can be like a safety net for critical infrastructures. I wish it was not the attack on the Ukraine that would serve as an example over and over for the criticality um, of satellite internet for governmental communication in conflict. My third point is about the market, the market for internet connectivity solutions. And that point is very simple. Alternatives for connectivity enlarge the market, and depending on the business models of the providers, uh, which vary, as we have heard, choice may arise for end users. That, again, can stimulate competition, and if some other factors about the local connectivity situ situation and the ecosystem um, uh, on the ground are given as well, affordability of internet access can increase, not only for the users of broadband from space, this is a thesis. I encourage us to monitor the pricing level development um, in regard to this empirically. My fourth point goes more directly to the global dimension of the governance of LEO satellite internet. It has been alluded to in, in the previous, com uh, previous, um, uh, previous talks. All global citizens can be viewed as stakeholders in broadband from space because they share the risks that are associated with this technology, like the serious damage that could, could occur from space debris, the environmental cost of launching rockets and others. And at the same time, there is and probably will be only a handful of spacefaring nations who host industries that are actually operating or are at the verge of operating their own satellite constellations for broadband from space. And what does this mean? It means that for the foreseeable future, the shared fate of most countries will be that they will remain customers of only a few providers of broadband from space in a very concentrated market, also due to the limits of natural resources, such as space, such as frequencies, as long as the advancements um, with the, uh, what Larry Press was talking about are not reality yet. So these countries may ask themselves if the connectivity that the providers of broadband from space deliver together as well as individually comes at acceptable conditions for them. Think of the digital policy quality of that type of connectivity. What do I mean by that? 
For one, every provider can be expected to comply with the rules of their own jurisdiction of origin when it comes to how they treat the traffic, the data that they transmit. Think of varying provisions for data protection, cybersecurity regulation, or frankly, surveillance. And then, of course, in addition, everything that Berner has just mentioned with regard to the, uh, to the national regulation, um, but also the jurisdiction of origin matters. And second, how can countries make sure that their connectivity is not terminated involuntarily? For instance, because a provider goes bankrupt, as we have seen in that first wave of industry development or because of political leanings, as Berner has just pointed out. So I encourage us to think about the qualities of those policy underpinnings for, CO, for LEO satellite connectivity and that they matter. Another aspect of this is the ability to switch providers easily because being dependent on one company or one man puts customers in a difficult position, especially when broadband from space shall safeguard critical infrastructures. That is an issue of global internet governance because the limited resources in orbital space and frequencies prohibit unlimited growth of this industry. So there's not better policy qualities by growth. There's a privileged position of a few and that may give rise to a different notion of responsibility for these providers as well. So far, all providers offer their own proprietary hardware, as we've heard, for, for base stations and other equipment. So working towards standardization and interoperability of equipment could go a long way towards preventing lock-in effects. From what we hear at this moment, um, the European Union constellation, Iro Square, might be the first one to go into that direction of at least standardizing such hardware. Um, we will see about the degrees of openness. Let me close with a few empirical observations so we don't only speak on this high level. Because in order for LEO satellite internet to operate in a given country, as we've just heard, certain regulatory and institutional setup is favorable. However, this can be a major undertaking, specifically as the industry is developing so, so quickly, to put such a framework in place. And that is why it appears beneficial for non-spacefaring nations to, on the one hand, document and share best practices in order to, on the second, possibly identify opportunities to align their interests vis-a-vis -vis providers. To get an initial idea of where we are standing, we have looked at emerging policy environments in 10 of the partner countries, um, initially on the African continent, really just to get a very rough idea. And um, I don't have time to go into much detail, so I will keep it very brief, but we found that countries are moving relatively quickly to authorize and license LEO systems. Uh, so there is demand. Um, just to give you some examples, Ghana, Kenya, Mozambique, Nigeria, and Rwanda, currently all have commercial LEO services deployed in their countries. Tunisia is considering trialing LEO connectivity, and others are actively deciding what path to take or what regulatory approach to watch, uh, towards um, making requirements for businesses, etc. That These countries are Senegal, South Africa, Tanzania, and Uganda. Um, one thing that will be important to note is also that we found that all of these countries already participate in international satellite organizations. They are all WTO members. They have experience in negotiating issues at the relevant ITU conferences uh, for world radio communication. And they also have experience from previous satellite developments in um, introducing other satellite systems into their connectivity ecosystem. And what comes on top of that with regard to the topic of our session um, about data governance is that they are all members of the African Union, which is actively examining issues related to data localization and cross-border data flows and just has recently put in a framework that will serve to uh, develop local policies around this. So these experiences will have provided most regulators and poly policymakers in those countries with years of experiences, with skills to handle broadband from space, and I suggest that we build on this to fast-track participation by others. So to sum up, if asked why LEO satellite internet is important for development, I would answer LEO satellite internet broadband from space con con can contrib contribute quickly to closing the digital divide or divides. It can serve to increase robustness of internet connectivity. It enlarges the market for internet provision. It is not going to go away for the foreseeable future, 
And so there's a lot of room for dialogue, for coordination and for mutual capacity building, particularly, not only, but particularly among non-spacefaring nations to shape satellite internet to the benefit of all. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much. That's exactly the intervention we were looking for with that targeted approach to developing countries and possibly recommendations to governments who are looking into deploying LEOs into their jurisdictions. Um, I will say follow-up questions for the Q&A and I'm certain there will be questions from the room, but thank you very much for highlighting that specific aspect of new technologies rapidly developing. And last but not least, please let me turn the floor over to Peter Mietzik, who's the General Counsel and UN Policy Manager within Access Now, an NGL that needs no introduction, but I am certain that in his intervention, Peter will tell us more why Access Now might have an interest in data mm -hmm. governance through low Earth orbit satellites. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, and um, yeah, I thank the other panelists for um, well laying out, I think, the, the facts as they stand now, um, and then some of the potential and current regulatory um, risks and opportunities. I will come in um, with our perspective as a human rights organization, Access Now, um, always needs an introduction. Uh, we're a global, um, organization that uh, defends and extends uh, the digital rights of people and communities at risk. Um, and uh, our uh, team members in more than 35 countries are encountering um, the, the emerging uh, low Earth orbit satellite sector in a number of different ways. And um, that is uh, what I hope to present a bit of. Um, so I suppose I could start, um, you know, with uh, some of the the risks that we see as a human rights organization. Uh, we are very concerned about um, the consolidated control over this um, the sector as it stands now. Um, speakers have mentioned Starlink is uh, the first mover; they have that advantage here. Uh, but it is up to the the whims of uh, the founder and controller of that uh, industry of that um, of that firm, which which constitutes the industry right now. Um, of you know available retail services, and our our partners uh, in Ukraine are uh, very concerned that the entire nation, its military, civilians, and civil society are dependent on this one company and its egotistic owner, um, who seems to want to decide the outcome of the war. And uh, there's really little that we can do about it. So civil society again. Um, you know, uh, desperate for connectivity, uh, eager to reach the sustainable development goals uh, and, you know, access um, and exercise our fundamental rights like freedom of expression. Um, and of course, we'll, we'll reach for any uh, op opportunities we can. Um, access now runs, uh, coordinates the hashtag keep it on coalition against internet shutdowns. This is uh, a global coalition of more than 300 civil society organizations fighting intentional disruptions of connectivity. And inevitably, um, especially during longer term shutdowns, as we see in, in Sudan and uh, Kashmir and Myanmar, uh, people look to the skies with hope with hope that they can find a connection that will let them tell their story to the, to the world, release the evidence that they've collected on human rights abuses and atrocities, tell loved ones that they're still alive or that they need electronic money transfers, you know, all the things that, that we rely on for connectivity become uh, compounded and, and pressurized in situations of, of armed conflict and uh, uh, desperation. And um, of course, people are going to uh, look to satellites. Um, and unfortunately, though, as I said, this leaves us in you know, the hands of, of very few um, you know, Western companies again. Uh, so uh, I think it's um, it's worth noting that uh, you know the user terminals themselves uh, do 
put people at risk. Um, so another another risk here is that you know this consolidated control creates single points of vulnerability. Um, and I know we don't want to get too much into cybersecurity, but um, it was really exciting to see this summer at the DEF CON conference um, a, a live competition uh, where teams actually hacked into a satellite, a low Earth orbit satellite, hack, um, or orbiting the Earth uh, in real time. And um, that was, uh, I believe, the first ever comp such competition where a satellite was hacked in, um, in real time uh, for prizes. It was, a, it was a LEO satellite launched on J June 5th. And I, if someone could put in the chat, um, it's Hackasat uh, is, the, is the website um, that they used. Uh, I'll put it there. Um, and uh, you know, a few things were learned from this competition. I think uh, one was it was really interesting to see the satellite went dark for four hours as it crossed over Antarctica. I think it was, and so uh, the teams uh, didn't know if their hacks were successful. Uh, they had to wait until uh, the the satellite came back um, within reach uh, to both deliver their payloads and and uh, and extract the data. And um, the winning team was able to hack into the the camera on the satellite, uh, which is about this big, and um, take pictures of specific points on Earth, uh, which was pretty cool to see. But uh, underscores that um, there is active interest in um, uh, attacking the cybersecurity of these. Um, and uh, so, to the extent that we're dependent on them, you know, with uh, incredibly sensitive data, um, if we're talking about places uh, where people are vulnerable um, and, and at risk, which, you know, probably overlaps a bit with those spaces that are currently not covered by terrestrial uh, connectivity, um, then, you know, that, that highlights um, and exacerbates the risks. Um, same goes for you know, these, these humanitarian contexts. Um, many uh, operators are looking at ways to, operators of, um, ad, of aid organizations, um, providers of humanitarian assistance are looking, you know, to, to more efficiently deploy after natural disasters or, or you know, human disasters and um, uh, are certainly looking at uh, these solutions. Um, but uh, again, what kind of, um, are, we, are we sending them into a trap, you know, where there's actually increased vulnerability uh, and dependency um, on these systems that can be, um, you know, turned off or, or you know, deprecated through through commercial uh, phaseouts at a moment's notice, um, and. Uh, yeah, uh, the, and the last point, and I kind of want to get at was was this pixelated regulatory picture, right? Um, we've seen the number of different uh, potential frameworks that apply. Um, I've mentioned international humanitarian law. Uh, there's of course uh, space law. Um, out here uh, in the in the convention center expo, there's actually a high altitude platform system, a giant wing that's being uh, demonstrated this week. That's not a low Earth orbit satellite, but it, it is um, meant to fly for six months at a time on solar power at about 62,000 feet. Uh, maybe somebody can do the uh, metric conversion, but um, it's really exciting to see, right? People are excited about these. Um, uh, but that you know would would bring in yet another you know I think aviation law uh, would apply there, um, uh, telecoms law uh, you know I think in various ways uh, these firms are are more akin to you know the telecoms that we know in other ways they're more akin to fly by night you know top of the stack um, application and session layer web startups um, and it's it's interesting to see how and uh, you know uh, these different analogies and different bodies of law might apply and regulation might apply or might not be adaptable um, but as civil society again in this pixelated regulatory picture we don't know and uh, where to engage we don't know how to engage we don't have access to the international telecommunication union um, as as many companies and governments do, uh, and uh, we don't, uh, you know, we are not adept at uh, space law. For I don't know where you know uh, the the intricacies of space law, you know, are open to civil society input. Um, I do want to finish by talking about um, the data protection and privacy um, uh, at issue. Um, and you know, the the positive is that human rights are universal, right? Universal. So uh, these, these rights that are inter interdependent, indivisible, they've got laser links between all the human rights already set up. 
um, this is a framework that we can depend on and that we should utilize. And it's no different for the fundamental right of data protection. Um, these, uh, the, the fundamental right in here is in the individual where they are, um, where they reside. Um, and uh, to the extent a processor of this data you know, touches uh, and concerns the EU, then the GDPR will, um, will apply to any personal data um, that's flowing, and we can assume that it will. Uh, and so, you know, I think it behooves um, this sector to, to put a foot forward and to engage in civil society organizations like Access Now, like EDRI in Europe, um, but across Africa where, you know, data protection, the Malibu Convention is, is growing uh, steam, Convention 108 already has a footprint. There are, there is a basis for, um, you know, global protection of our fundamental rights to data protection. There's a growing system of uh, regulators to uh, enforce and apply that right. Um, and, uh, you know, we are going to be look, um, looking to, um, to do so. Um, you know, one caveat, sorry, uh, I'll finish on this, is that um, with respect to your presentation, uh, these companies do not need to comply with these various laws and regulations. They are currently operating in Iran and in many other places where they are not welcome, they are not in compliance, but they are delivering services to people, including people at risk on the ground who need the services. And so I think in that sense, it may be more akin to the, the, the top layers of the stack in that they may, not, they may decide not to establish offices in local countries um, and submit themselves to various jurisdiction. Um, if they find it in the interests of you know the companies and and I will assert that you know users at risk in Myanmar are very keen on um, gaining access to these tools um, in a way that you know probably will not ever comply with you know uh, the the local um, uh, jurisdiction and regulations. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Peter. Uh, there is nothing more uh, comforting to a moderator than speakers who have differing opinions. That is a discussion ready made. But just to keep us on track, and I do note that our panelists likely do have direct feedback to the further interventions, um, I would like to turn the floor over to Berna and kindly request her assistance with the Q&A. There might be questions in the room which I'm not able to assess um, uh, moderating remotely. If there are questions in the chat or from our remote participants, do feel free to raise your virtual hand and you will be granted the floor. Um, Berna, if you could um, uh, support us here with the Q&A, that would be most appreciated. Thank you. Um, so if uh, any of our guests on the floor, if you have any questions, uh, you may come to the microphone. Um, at the moment, we do not seem to have any questions, so maybe, um, Joanna, you can start off uh, with your question and give time to our guests to think about theirs. Great, thank you. I do note that Dan would like to directly respond. Dan, do feel free to take the floor. Sure, I know it's great to hear what uh, Berna said and, and Uta and, and Peter. I think, Peter, I'm, I'm with you on sort of when I got involved with the Internet Society Project, uh, back at the beginning in, in late 2021, I sort of naively had this idea um, because I had no exposure to satellite information. So I had this naive idea that, for instance, in Sudan, you know, we could somehow get a terminal into Sudan somehow and be able to uh, provide it to people so they could be able to have internet access and share information, all this kind of stuff. And my my uh, <laughs> my naivete lasted until I got talking to people like Berna and Joanna about ITU and, and space law and, and the regulations around that. And, and you're absolutely right, Peter's absolutely right, that there is no technical reason why this cannot happen. You know, Starlink can be turned on for every country in the world at some point, and, and, and it, on a technical level, that can go on. And that's what we see happening in Iran. The, the challenge, of course, is the legal side and the, the reality that it is bounded on the borders based on this fact that as, as Berna talked about, you know, they have to go into each and every country and get approval for the landing rights, for the spectrum to be able to go for down and up. They have to be, get a consumer approval. They have to go and do all of that for um, for each and every country. And so it is a case where, and, and if they, you know, I think you can get away with it in doing it in Iran because quite honestly, the rest of the international world is not really going to be too concerned. And in fact, they would probably prefer it to be turned on there. However, if you turn it on for other countries and other spaces, you start to get into um, 
you know, very lots of international pressure, attention, things on that. It just it's not something you can go and do. You have some countries such as China that have been very clear that if it gets turned on in China, they might take actual activity. They've done war gaming scenarios around what it would take to go and shoot down satellites. I mean, there's there's lots of different pieces that sort of keep that in check at the moment, which, to be honest, I was disappointed about because I I, I was hoping it could be that, you know, get that freedom, get it out there and everywhere. You also raise the other good point, which is that unlike a passive, like a geostationary dish for broadcast TV, uh, broadcast TV that's pointed up at a geostationary satellite, it's a one-way downlink. It's just receiving the signals. It's just passively getting that. But once you do this for internet access, you're doing two-way communication. And you do, to Peter's point, you can expose, you're exposing that transmitter. You know, in the Ukraine, I know that there have been some of the groups that are there that are making sure that they only turn the transmitters on at certain times, that they put them away. You see pictures of, of groups of people putting them at a distance away from where the people are in case the signal intelligence hones in on where it is and targets it with a, with a weapon or something. So you are exposing yourself because it is two-way communication. And that is a critical difference in what we're talking about here. Um, and I also join, join you, Peter, and, and others in that concern about you know, the control of billionaires. It is right now, it's primarily you're seeing, you know, um, SpaceX with Elon Musk, you see Project Kuiper, which ultimately is Jeff Bezos. You know, you see those kind of solutions up there. OneWeb has now been purchased by Utilsat. So it's now a corporate entity under, and Utilsat is a French corporate, you know, different things around that, but it's all these bigger players. We don't have what we had in the early days of the internet, for instance, in the terrestrial based, where you had university networks, ho hobbyist networks, uh, a large challenge is just the sheer cost of launching all of this in some certain way. But uh, lots to be lots to be going on in there. I'll defer to others. Thank you. Thank I, you. Yeah. I would Thank also like much, to make Sarah. a uh, short note. Um, so as lawyers, um, we um, tend to explain um, what the law is, what, what the reg you know, how the regulations apply. And so that doesn't always represent how we personally think about the matter, yes? So if you ask me a question about the uh, human rights law approach, then my answer uh, should have, um, uh, would, have <laughs> uh, would have had a different perspective on the matters that we have just discussed. So um, I think, um, uh, you know, as always, we tend to believe that rule of law is important and that, you know, if you are going to uh, breach the rules, then you uh, are damaging the system as a whole. So, um, you know, taking these into consideration, um, my talk was more about explaining how the rules and regulations apply to the satellite broadband te technology as it is. So, um, of course, the civil, civil society approach would be different. The human rights law approach would be different. Um, but um, that wasn't my, uh, <laughs> I didn't include that in my speech. So I just wanted to make a little note of that, yeah. Thank you very much, Bernard. I have a sense that our other panelists might also have something they would like to add. So I'm going to check first if Peter, Uta, or Larry have anything to immediately respond, for example, to Dan's comments. Yeah, all kinds of stuff has been kind of uh, thought provoking. I guess I am really, I'll be upfront. I am um, disappointed and kind of frightened by Elon Musk. Uh, <laughs> He, he did amazing things, but he's get if you follow him on Twitter and the stuff that he's starting to post now, it's very political, uh, and it's political in a way that I don't like. So I guess maybe that's. Do, do the rest of you guys uh, have concern about that guy? Now I can see our other speakers. Peter Uta, please do feel free to take the floor. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, let's get to a place where where there's there is you know meaningful competition, but within a, a regulatory framework. I mean, yeah, you know, we appreciate innovation. And Larry, I was thinking of your your presentation because um, you didn't talk about the '90s, right? Which which my understanding is when there was a ton of interest in the low Earth alb um, orbit sector um, and a lot of failures. And and so I was you know wondering, yeah, if mm -hmm. you could 
Uh, there was so. there was well, the one you're probably thinking of is Telesat, uh, and uh, Telesat, not Telesat. Tell us. Uh, huh? What was it called? It was. Well, I mean, Iridium Global Sat Global. No, uh, no, 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 no. Before that, uh, Tell us. Bill Gates one. Uh, no, teledesic. No. Teledesic. Teledesic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah but they. Um, it was Bill Gates and a Saudi prince and a uh, a guy who had, had at the time recently sold a, a mobile company. Uh, they did a. They attempted to do this in the in the nineties, um, but the technology just wasn't there. Um, well, and, I think and, the main reason it failed. And the other point is, it was focused on telecom. It was not necessarily fully focused on on providing internet access at the kind of scale. Mm -hmm. And and it I was mean, really, which is what um, I mean. Iridium is still up there, and actually, they're looking mm -hmm. at launching a new range of satellites to provide data services and pieces like that. But but it was a it, it, but you know and and we don't know a lot of the systems that are being proposed right now may fail in a similar way. You have to figure out: Do you have the business product that's that's mm -hmm. that's there? Um, and the other part is now, twenty years later, um, almost you know thirty years later, I guess in some ways, in some of that, you have this enormous change in the capacity of launch systems and mass production of, system, of satellites. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of what's yeah. changed uh, today. I think, I think teledesic was they, they weren't going. They were in fact going for uh, you know internet connectivity. Internet was different in those days. It was yeah. mostly text. For me, it was text oriented, only uppercase because I had a teletype at home. Um, but they there were the technology was not up for it, um, and um, it just wasn't economically viable. All viable the satellite technology, the launch technology. Um, it it just it couldn't have been uh, at the time. Um, it was. Thank you, Larry. Was, yeah. Great. Thank you so much. We do have a question from Mike. Before I hand the floor over to Uta, please just let me read out the question. It just might be that uh, you would like to reference that question as well. The question from Mike reads, radio spectrum access is regulated to prevent interference and allow coordinated usage. However, in the optical domain, there is effectively no interference that would warrant regulation. What tensions could we see from governments trying to extract fees from the optical spectrum? Uh, if you wish to address that question directly, Uta, do feel free to do so. Do take the floor, and then I will ask our other panelists if they wish to address Mike's question directly. Uh, Uta, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. I very much appreciate the question, and at the same time, I find it very far-reaching, and at this moment, a little bit beyond the uh, the level of discussion at the um, at the moment of um, at this stage of development. But also, it's something that I would want to think about, um, frankly. Um, but I, I've also been asked, uh, so what, what are possible avenues if we acknowledge or we, if we all establish together that there is an importance of sort of some kind of multi-stakeholder input into the development, the further development of this industry and possibly policy, policy, uh, policy options, then what could be things that we could be doing. And I just wanted to throw a couple of things in the room um, so maybe uh, those can be picked up by people who listen here. So for one, of course, there's uh, an option to hold listening sessions um, by all the providers and future providers of these systems. Um, this, of course, includes the EU, but maybe also the other providers could be interested. It would certainly go a long way towards providing some transparency into their system, which, uh, as this session exemplifies, could be, um, could be demanded. And it would give the public an opportunity to have their views heard. Um, Another uh, important thing could be to also talk to, to financing and investment um, opportunities um, and see what, the, what the, the ways of support having, for instance, blended finance impact event investors uh, come in to support um, 
sat um, satellite internet from space in the countries that currently cannot or have not afforded it so far. Um, we should and could document the best practices um, on, in terms of regulatory approaches, also with regard to how do these companies um, that do exist and uh, the countries that do want to be customers, how can they do a quick onboarding and how, to, how can they um, move the services uh, into, um, activate the services quickly. Um, there is, there's another aspect of really doing research, keep like financing research about this, because uh, as we've probably all seen in our preparation for the session, there is not so much empirical evidence uh, with regard to many of the important questions of this topic. Um, there may be an opportunity for some countries to think about twinning programs to sort of move together on, on forward on this topic. And um, specifically with regard to Iris Square, I feel like it's worth throwing in the room that depending on the views that are being held from, uh, from the finances of this constellation um, and the populations that stand behind them, there may be an opportunity to also think about connectivity from space as an in-kind sort of development service, as, if you will. So not only providing countries with the capacity building they, they need to set up, the, uh, set up their institutions, etc., but also to really directly just provide that connectivity. I'm not sure if that's being done uh, much before, uh, but it could certainly be an avenue. And then certainly there's coalition building in general just to foster the interest of this very large common consumer group. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much, Muta. I'm curious if any of our speakers might have an answer for Mike as well. That seems a really interesting question. I do agree it is an early stage uh, of I, development uh, for the optical spectrum infrastructure I, I, to I, yeah. governmental. Yes, Dan, please go ahead. I think it's uh, I think it's uh, it's a good question. I mean, the basic point is that if you're doing optical connectivity you're it's you know it's a direct connection you're not in the yeah it's not shared as mike said sir i think it's really early i think we have to see where these things get proved out you know larry provided a great overview of a lot of the different work that's happening in this space to ground connectivity and what's uh, what's going on in that but i think uh, i think we've still got a bit to go uh, to mike's point it's probably good to think be thinking about that in advance so that these things don't get trapped into, you know, regulatory capture or, or wind up, uh, you know, with great impediments to doing that. But, but um, I think we're still early. Yeah. Am I turned off? You know, just Please, so the comments are big. Yeah, just, I feel like if we just have a kind of a bull session here. Um, actually, I should turn on my, there you go. Um, you know, with respect to kind of having um, how to subsidize it and whatnot, to some extent, I think that takes care of itself. If if if, a, if the people in an area, people in a nation, um, can't afford connectivity to say SpaceX or to one of these little things, um, to the extent that 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 will mean they have excess capacity over that nation. And to some extent, uh, uh, I remember when Elon Musk first did, he came out and said, hey, we're going to charge the same price everywhere. And that was crazy because it makes no sense. You want to charge a price that will kind of uh, keep your uh, up to use up your, your entire available capacity. So to some extent, just the economics of it take care of uh, kind of the different income levels of, of different countries in different regions. Make sense? I mean, it's come to true. It's come to pass that he definitely charges different rates in different countries. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Larry. I'm just going to quickly check if any of our panelists would like to add anything to the session. We are about to wrap up. And before I do so, I'm just going to check if anyone would like to add anything we might have missed or if there's any direct feedback from the room. Fair enough, please go ahead. Just to uh, add to uh, Uta's points, well, we overlap, uh, but um, you know, what, what would we advise to the developing countries? So I want to refer back to our um, policy paper and um, quickly list what we had recommended them 
to effectively use this technology. So uh, we recommended them to re-evaluate re and update the domestic regulations related to licensing and authorizing satellite broadband services to consider the, the um, different business models and the impact on um, their autonomy when deciding on gateways, for example. And we recommended forming regional alliances to enhance uh, achievement of their local uh, policy goals. And um, we also uh, recommended them to participate actively in the ITU uh, consultations, um, especially in the uh, ITUR, which uh, manages frequency spectrum and orbital resources. And again, if this is done through regional alliances, as they are doing now, uh, it will enhance their chances of achieving their desired outcomes. And um, also, they should reassess their commitments under trade treaties. Um, they are not set, set in stone. They could be um, renegotiated. Uh, and these should be considered um, uh, with their uh, renewed interests and priorities associated with uh, this technology and also familiarize themselves with uh, space law, which, uh, is not, uh, which hasn't been of interest to many non-spacefaring uh, nations. I think awareness of uh, rules is essential to, essential to make informed decisions. So, and a holistic considerations of these actions, I think, is necessary to, um, uh, to uh, ensure that their initiatives align with their sustainable development goals. Great. Thank you very much. Dan, please go ahead. Sure. I, I would just, uh, one thing I want to say about the panel was, um, I just want to say to Uda that I, I loved her points that she had, because I think you very succinctly, you know, summarized really some of the key issues and, and points around here. Uh, I would add a point, you know, the robustness, the resiliency is something that we've seen as a critical part uh, I'm a volunteer here in the United States for an organization called the ITDRC, which is the IT Disaster Resources, and, and, and they have been deploying into places like uh, Florida when there was Hurricane Ian and also into the wildfires that are going on out in the, in the western part of the United States. And they can take a satellite dish on a pickup truck, for instance, and be able to bring it in and provide Wi-Fi connectivity for the first responders and the other people who are in the incident command area. It's, it's, it's a kind of ubiquitous connectivity that we have never had access to before. It's, it's just mind blowing and what it can do in the kind of spaces around that. So I think it's important to, you know, for all the, all the challenges, there's, a, there's an amazing amount that it, it can do in the right ways. And I think we, we need to figure out how to get it right. Um, I think uh, it really is, I would also point what Bernard just mentioned, the, a lot of us in the internet space, if we interact with the ITU, we primarily interact with the ITUT, the telecommunications sector or the ITUD around development. We don't do as much historically with the ITUR, the radio, the radio telecommunication side, but that's where all of this happens in satellites because of the spectrum. And people should pay attention to the World Radio Congress coming up later this in the next uh, November here, uh, so November, December, because that will be the every four years, the gathering of people to talk about this. And while Leos aren't directly on the agenda, there's side conversations, there's other places, there's things that'll be paying. So I would encourage people to pay attention to that. And, and my final point would just be, we need to have more of these conversations because this is this new emerging um, you know, field. There's a lot of satellites gonna be launched over the next while that's happening. And we need to collectively make sure that we can get it right to the degree that we can from a societal point of view. So I encourage everybody to read, Berna's document that was in there, read our Leo's document, read other documents, and share this, get people talking about it, because we have to be talking about these questions. Great, thank you. Peter, do go ahead. Quickly, thanks. Yeah, uh, to sort of piggyback and, and reinforce Dan's comments, um, we need to have more conversations um, but, you know, as civil society, we are heavily dependent on governments um, in this space. Um, governments are, you know, I think, putting forward a lot of the funding necessary. Um, they're uh, going to be doing a lot of the procurement, including through their defense industries and defense spending. Um, and, uh, you know, presumably they're the ones talking to these companies. I'm, I'm a very privileged person, you know, white male in the U.S. I know 
the public policy director for SpaceX, and uh, you know I can't get any of my calls returned. And so uh, I think just to underscore that, like what at what an asymmetrical you know uh, disadvantage we're at when we're trying to influence public policy in this space. Um, that we are heavily dependent, and you know, governments, you know, are, it seemed to be in a lot of competition over, you know, this sector. Um, but you know, I'm I'm buoyed by things like yesterday, the the Freedom Online Coalition launched these called donor principles on uh, human rights in the digital age, and I think those are getting at ways to harmonize um, and raise standards around government procurement and and support for new and emerging technologies, and and should urgently be applied uh, to this space. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. I could do uh, nothing more but to strongly support all the points that have just been made. We do need to have more of these conversations, and I do welcome a relatively significant presence of LEOs on the agenda of the IGF. It is a theme that the multi-stakeholder community should pay attention to before it's too late, as our speakers have emphasized during this panel. We are out of time, so I will uh, refrain from summarizing the panel more thoroughly. Thank you very much for joining us. Sincere thanks to our speakers. Thank you for all the points that you guys have made. Thank you for being here both virtually and in person. And to those of you who are in the room or online joining us, do feel free to reach out to the speakers directly and share your feedback because this is the time to do Leo's policy that serves the broader internet community. Thank you, everyone. With this, the session is adjourned. Sure. Thank you, Joanna. Yeah, I wish Thank we could keep the bull session going. Thank you, Joanna, for leading us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.